Good afternoon or morning, whatever it is for you. Okay, so I want to now talk about going from understanding the physical layout of the experiment to understanding the statistical layout of the experiment to determining effects in a model. And I think it probably behooves us to kind of do a new problem here um, just to show the process in its entirety, focusing on uh, at the end how we go from a statistical uh, layout of our experiment to um, the effects that we were put in a on a, any statistics program, but SAS jump in particular in biometry class. Okay, so in this study we have a researcher interested in global climate change, and they they set up two growth chambers. Let's just go ahead and kind of draw the physical layout of this. So they have two growth chambers, one over here, one over here. And one is set at 400 parts per million, and one is set at 800 parts per million. Okay? Um, so elevated CO2, ambient CO2. Within each of the growth chambers, the student places four trays of plants. So we can draw these in here like this. Okay, the tray. Presumably these trays allow us to pick up a bunch of pots at the same time and move them around. See, I've made my growth chambers different sizes, haven't I? All right, so we have our eight trays and we may want to label those. So tray one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. All right. In each tray are 100 plants, so we have n equals 100 here. All right. Um, half of the pots in each tray contain ecotype A, and half of them contain ecotype B. So, and uh, these, of course, would have to be randomly arrayed in here. So, if we were to actually draw them in, we would see that they're intermixed, and that we are completely randomly randomizing within trays. And we would have an equal number, n equals 50 of ecotype A and n equals 50 of ecotype B. Okay? So the same things are going on in these other trays. All right, so what's their question? Their question is whether the two ecotypes are responding differentially to the two CO2 levels. So they measure something like growth which would be, for example, final, final mass uh, of the plants minus initial seed mass divided by time. So that would be a growth per unit time measure. All right, so how do we determine um, the effects to put in a model here? Well, first of all, let's go ahead and figure out the statistical layout. So what are our factors here? So we have our CO2 level, which is being manipulated in the two growth chambers. And by the way, we just have one growth chamber at each CO2 level, don't we? So notice that um, CO2 level is confounded with growth chamber. So that's unfortunate with our experimental design because we would have to assume that all the other differences between growth chambers don't matter and that we can attribute our differences in mean growth between the two chambers to CO2. Um, and in fact, maybe that's not the case. So um, better experimental design would be to have multiple growth chambers at each CO2 level, but maybe we can't afford that. Maybe we only have two available to us. And so we have um, this confounding going on no matter what. So let's go ahead and assume we have to deal with that. And uh, so what else do we have here? We have ecotype identity. And the levels of ecotype are A versus B, right? So we have ecotype and every ecotype is found in every tray. We have 50 of each in each tray. And of course then tray comes into this too. So we need to try to figure out the relationship between these three variables. Is there anything else? I don't think so. Okay, so we have CO2 level, ecotype, and tray. And by the way, we could, you know, if we had an individual sitting here in a pot, we could, um, what, we could tell what CO2 level that is. CO2 equals 400. 
we could tell what tray that's in, tray equals four, and um, we could tell what ecotype that is. Maybe it's ecotype equals B. And what we're really doing when we're doing our analysis of variance is we're trying to understand the relative impacts of these independent variables on whatever we're measuring on that individual. Okay, so we're doing that with all of our replication. So what's the model going to look like? Our statistical design or statistical layout should help us a lot. First of all, let's look pairwise at these factors that we've determined are here. CO2 and ecotype. Do I have both ecotypes in both CO2 levels? In other words, if I look over here, do I have A's, B's, and C's? Or A's and B's, sorry, I don't have any C's. Yes, I do. I have both ecotypes in both CO2 levels, obviously because I'm interested in the differential response. I would make sure of that. So I can cross CO2 level with ecotype. So I'll put ecotype on one axis, and I have both of those ecotypes at both CO2 levels, 400 and 800. And I have a large N in each of those. But I have tray. I need to figure out tray here. So what about um, ecotype and tray? Let's consider that pair. Do I have both ecotypes in every tray? Yeah, I do. So I'm going to want to cross ecotype with tray. But before I draw in those lines, um, let's, let's look at tray and CO2. Is a tray unique to a given CO2 level or vice versa? Um, actually, tray is unique to a given CO2 level. And where do I have the replication? Do I have multiple CO2 levels per tray or do I have multiple trays per CO2 level? I have multiple trays per CO2 level. So tray is going to be nested within CO2 level. So I can draw tray in as vertical dashed lines, dashed lines indicating that they are subdivisions within the CO2 level. So tray one, uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, so, and I can write, so this entire thing is straight. And in fact, we can see now that not only is ecotype crossing CO2 perpendicular, but ecotype is crossing tray. I have each ecotype in each tray, so they cross at right angles. And that's going to actually indicate to me um, what my uh, oops, what my testable designs are. Oops, let me pull that back up. Sorry about that. There we go. What my testable effects are. All right, so let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger, and we'll try to erase and keep that beautiful diagram there. <laughs> Oops, there we go. Oh well, we got it small again. All right, so we now are going to try to figure out what are our effects in the model. We know we have three effects, CO2, ecotype, and tray, but what's the relationship to one another? Well, we'll start on the outside of this diagram. So we'll put in ecotype. We know that's going to be a main effect. We have a main effect of ecotype. And then we're going to put CO2. And at each of these, we want to see if anything's nested within them. And we are going to um, give that next. Oops, sorry, I'm covering myself up here. Logistic problems here. Okay, so we have ecotype, CO2, um, and we have tray. And tray, we can see, is nested within CO2. So we write it like that. And I'm going to give these shorthand. I'm going to call ecotype E. Uh, CO2C and tray T within C. All right. Now, as we are listing effects, that's what we're doing now. We're listing effects in our model that we want to set up and jump. We need to consider them pairwise. So, ecotype 
cross CO2. And by the way, typically we will put the nested effect right below the effect within which it is nested. And that's on purpose. Okay, so we put that right below CO2 tray because it's nested within um, CO2. But generally we go from simple to more complex terms in our model. So let's now consider the two-way terms. So we have ecotype cross CO2. Do we have that? Yes, we do. Because we have every level of ecotype with every level of CO2. Great. How about, so we have ecotype cross CO2. How about CO2 cross tray? Does, do the CO2 divisions cross the tray divisions? No, they're parallel, so we can't do CO2 cross tray. So let me repeat that. See, our divisions dividing the trays from 1, 2 to 3 are parallel to our divisions dividing 400 from 800. That means they don't cross. They're not at independent. They're not at 90 degree angles. They are codependent. We have tray 1, 2, 3, and 4 only found at 400. Tray 5, 6, 7, and 8 only found at 800. So we can't cross those terms because we don't have every possible combination. All right, so CO2 is not crossed with tray. How about ecotype with tray? So we have ecotype. Here's the division for ecotype levels. And it is crossing the tray division. So we do have ecotype cross tray within CO2. All right, how about the three-way? To get a three-way, we would need a cube. And we don't have a cube. Um, but we can sort of check, do we have each ecotype with each CO2 level with each tray? No. We've already seen that tray is um, not crossed with CO2, so we can't do a higher level interaction with it either. Okay, so these are our effects in the model, and that's the way we've determined them. We've got a complete list of effects in the model. We can't do the three-way. Um, now, the next thing we need to do is talk about random versus fixed effects. We've mentioned that before. So I want to talk about random versus fixed. Um, ecotype, you know, this is one of those terms that could be either random or fixed depending upon whether, one, we care about those particular ecotypes or if they were randomly selected from a larger group. Now, typically we are interested in those particular ecotypes. So, and someone else could go back and repeat this experiment and pick those same ecotypes. So I'm going to treat them as fixed. CO2 is clearly a fixed because it's a particular CO2 level that we have chosen for a reason. It's not a random CO2 level from a larger population of CO2 levels. Well, it is from a larger population, but it's not random, right? Someone could repeat this experiment and get those same levels again. And there would be a rationale for having chosen those levels. How about tray? Tray is definitely a random effect. Now, um, it's kind of interesting because tray is spatially in one location within the greenhouse, but we could make it more a better random effect if we actually rotated those trays around. And that might be a really good thing to do anyway, because um, those trays uh, are experiencing different parts of the growth chamber environment. So if we rotated them around, we could sort of homogenize that. Nevertheless, the plants in the, a given tray are going together from place to place and would have a common history. And so we still uh, would want to include that in our model to pull out any tray-to-tray vari -tray variation that we have due to that differential history of plants that were in a given tray. Okay, so that's a random effect. How about ecotype cross CO2? Okay, if we have a cross of two fixed effects, then that is also fixed. But if we have ecotype cross tray and tray is random, the cross of anything with a random effect is random. All it takes is one random effect, in this case tray, to make this entire term a random effect. Okay, so um, the next thing we're going to do is, is take a model like this and figure out how would we know whether our terms are testable or not. And that involves doing something called calculating expected mean squares. And I'll say there are a couple ways of doing this. One way is to make a dummy data set. And I really like this way, actually. 
Make a dummy data set like you're planning to collect uh, in your real experiment and designate this model, fix, set up this model and actually run it and see if it works. The second thing you can do is use a method called Chaffee's method to calculate expected mean squares. And that's what I'm actually going to do um, in my next video. All right, so that's it for today.